in our service tonight. We'd like to welcome Brother Tommy Peeler uh, to be our speaker this evening. Um, in our summer series, our topic tonight is the song, How Great Thou Art. So uh, tonight we'll be starting off with the first two verses of that song. Uh, then after that, we'll be led in prayer. And then our brother will come and bring us our message for the evening. So how great thou art, the first two verses. O oh Lord my God, when I am all pray together. Our most holy and righteous Father in heaven, we fail when we try to describe how great you really are. We understand with our minds, Father, that uh, you created everything that is, and yet sometimes we just can't fathom your greatness. And to put on top of that, Father, fathom your love for each one of us individually. We are so thankful that you care for us and you love us. That you allow the sun to rise and the moon to come up in the evenings because you love us and because that earth which you made will continue as long as you deem it to continue. Father, we thank you that we can come to you and express our thanks and our praise to you in word as we do now, in song as we do each time we meet together. And this song that we are going to discuss tonight is one that is just so wonderful and so majestic in its just description of you. Father, again, thank you. Thank you, Father, that you have offered a way for us to spend an eternity with you through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. Father, we know we don't deserve it. We're not even close to being worthy of it. But we're so thankful that you and he were willing to make that 
that sacrifice for us. We pray, Father, that you would help us each day as we live a life on this earth to live to be more like Jesus in everything we do. We know we fail, we know we're sorry for that. But we ask, Father, that you just help us. Help us to be in your word, help us to be about you, help us to be thinking about this great song and songs like it, about how great you are. Father, we thank you that we can come also before you and we can come and pray for those of our members and friends and neighbors and relatives that have needs. And certainly we all know of people who have needs. We have a number of people, Father, as you know, who are suffering from cancers and going through treatments for that. And we pray that you'll be with them and that you will strengthen them in body and in spirit. You will help the doctors to, to find good ways to uh, improve their health. Knowing, Father, that each one of us have a certain time here. And we know that you're in control of that. So we do pray for recoveries and we pray for, for good times for all these. Also down, down here on this earth with the virus that's going on right now. So many people are suffering from that. We pray, Father, that people will take it seriously and that you will be with us. We know you have the power to make things just go away. And it's our prayer that that will happen. But in all things, Father, we just pray that you will help us always to be positive, help us to be looking out for the health and safety of all those around us, and that we can be good stewards of the good things that you allow us to have and do. Father, we also need to remember that as we go along each day, as we praise you and as we as we sing to you and as we meet other people along the way, that we pray that our conduct will be such that they will see you living in us. We pray, Father, that you will help us to see those opportunities you place before us to do your will and to spread your word. Help us always be conscious of that, Father. It's easy to go through life and just uh, be busy about doing our own thing without thinking about others. Help us not to be that way. Help us always to be looking out for others. Father, we pray that you will help us through this night. May we be uh, spiritually lifted as we talk about this song and songs like it. Uh, we pray that you be with Brother Tommy as he, as he brings this message to us. And help us all, Father, to be strengthened in spirit and strengthened, Father, in our will. <coughs> To do what you want us to do. Be with those, Father, that, uh, uh, that are not here tonight. We pray that uh, this, again, this virus will soon be gone so we can all meet together and praise your name in all we do. We thank you for this time and be with us in all we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And without any ado, I want to introduce you to Brother Don Tommy Dealer. He churches, preaches at the congregation in Brandon, and he's been with us before. You all know that, and uh, you all know he always brings a great message to us. So, Brother Tommy, come on up. Thank you very much. And we, I, we, my wife and I are thrilled to be here, and uh, we hope the lesson will be beneficial to you. Okay, I have to make an acknowledgement here at the beginning, and I never thought I'd have to do this. Uh, is there a song book in the house that yeah. I can use? I can, I can go get you. Okay. <laughs> I understand why you don't have them out, but I don't know that I can quote every verse. <laughs> and I thought I could just pick up a song book along the way, and uh, lo and behold, I found it. And I, preach, I don't know. Jody's giving me one, but, but uh, so, okay, thank you. How great thou art, as we just sang, and what we're going to do tonight, and we're going to start by um, the um, slides, and what I'm going to do on the slides, and I want them to be, um, I want them to be, <laughs> okay, okay, <laughs> the unprotected song, that's right, and, um, but I will, um, 
What these, these will do, and we'll play these within the first couple of verses as we discuss the first couple of verses of the song. These slides, um, and I think they will zoom in on their own, they are just to let you stand in awe of what God has created. If what God has created is so awesome, so vast, so powerful, then how much more the God who made it. When we get to the third and fourth verses of the song and we focus more on redemption, we will uh, take down these pictures. I don't mean the pictures to be a distraction, but a help in singing, in understanding this song. But as we were singing just a moment ago, the first verse, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder, awe-inspiring wonder, as we said in the prayer, there, there's no way we can adequately describe God's greatness. When I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds your hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. It seems like to me in the first verse of this song that not only is creation focused upon, but the, the heavens are focused upon. The second verse may be different from that in that it seems to focus on some things that are in the earth. But whether they be things in heaven or things on the earth, they are proclaiming how great you are. Psalm 19 is where we will begin tonight. Psalm 19. In Psalm 19, in verses 1 through 6, and I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, the heavens are telling of the glory of God, and the expanse is declaring the work of His hands. Day to day pours for speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterance is to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens, and its circuit to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. The heavens are telling of God's glory. You can look up into the heavens, and you can see the majesty of the God who made our universe. Do you realize that if you started at one end of our galaxy, and travel the speed of light that it would take 100,000 years to get to the end of our galaxy. The distance between that and neighboring galaxies is even greater. And yet God spoke it all into existence with just a word. And when you look at the heavens, how vast they are, they are telling of God's glory. They are declaring the work of his hands. It is a constant testimony to his greatness. As verse 2 says, day to day pours forth knowledge. Day to day pours forth speech. And night to night reveals knowledge. It is a constant testimony to his greatness. And yet it is a silent testimony. In verse 3, there's no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. The heavens are a silent testimony to his glory. 
It is a language that is not spoken, but it's a language that is universal. In verse 4, their line has gone through all the earth, their utterances to the end of the world. It's interesting, those words are quoted in Romans 10 and verse 18 to say that the gospel has gone everywhere. Here in this particular context, it is telling us that the testimony of God in creation goes everywhere. Why is it that most all people who have ever lived have believed in God? Even though they believe in different gods and in different concepts, of it, why is it they have believed that? They have believed that because you look into the vast heaven and we know we didn't make it. We know that nothing else in all of creation is responsible for its own existence. This church building, for example, did not make itself. And so we automatically assume that someone made it. If I can look at this church building, and tell you there's someone who built it, even though I haven't met them personally and don't know who they are, why is it a stretch to see our world so much greater and so much bigger and to automatically conclude that someone made it? Someone way beyond us. And when you look into the heavens, and you see the glories of the heaven. They are constantly declaring and telling in a silent but universal language the glory of God. Day to day pours for speech and night to night reveals knowledge. In Romans chapter 1, in Romans chapter 1, in verse 20, the Bible tells us there, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, talking about God, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so they are without excuse. In the creation of the world, we see God's invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature. These invisible attributes are clearly seen through what he has made. Remember just a moment ago, I told you that it would take 100,000 light years, traveling speed of light, 100,000 years, to get from one end of our galaxy to the other. I'm not trying to tell you that to impress you with our world, but to impress you with the God who made. In Isaiah 40, the Bible describes God, and it says he holds the waters of the world in his hand, and he marks off the heavens by the span. He marks off the heavens as immense as the heavens are, as vast as they are. They are small compared to God. God as creator dwarfs his creation. And so if we ever look at anything in the heavens through a telescope, and we stand in awe of, who, uh, of how great our universe is and how vast it is, let us always remember that is but a dim reflection of how great God is, how glorious He is.
But it's the first verse of this particular song. The first verse of this song stresses the glory of God and how great God is by describing the vastness of the heavens like Psalm 8. When I consider uh, your heavens, the moon and the stars which you have made, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you visit him? The second verse, though stresses more, seems on earth. In the second verse of this song, How Great Thou Art, when through the woods and forest lanes I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees, when I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great now, nature is full of all kinds of beautiful scenes. You see this scene right here? You, this is the highest point in the state of Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Christy and I were talking though when we were driving here today. Florida doesn't have that kind of picture of a mountain. I've been told that the highest place in the state is about 300 feet. But still, it has a beauty of its own. When you look out, even right on the interstate out here, to the fields along the way that are covered with grass, and the cattle out in the fields, and the trees in the fields, it is just amazing to see the beauty that all the different places on earth have to offer. Some scenes like this, some mountain scenes like we saw before, some a scene of a beautiful field, but all of this ultimately, and there's a scene you don't see around here either, but all of these scenes that demonstrate the glory of God and proclaim his greatness. Now, why should I attribute these things to God? Why, should, why would I say that God has his hand in all of these? Because the Bible does. Uh, for example, in Psalm, Psalm 65, Psalm 65, beginning with verse 9. Just listen to these verses. As these verses describe beautiful scenes on earth and how God is the one behind it all. Psalm 65, beginning with verse 9. You visit the earth and cause it to overflow. You visit the earth. God visits the earth, causes it to overflow. You greatly enrich it. The stream of God is full of water. You prepare their grain, for thus you prepare the earth. You water its furrows abundantly. You settle its ridges. You soften it with flowers. You bless its growth. You've crowned that glory with your bounty. And your paths drip with fatness. The pastures of the wilderness drip, and the hills gird themselves with rejoicing. The mountains are clothed with flocks, and all the valleys are covered with rain. They shout for joy. Yes, they sing. Now, you're going to benefit more from that by reading Psalm 65, verses 9 through 13, slowly and carefully on your own, and notice how it attributes each step to the develop and the development of nature to God. Whether it is God causing the water to flow, the water to fall in rain, or God causing the grain to grow through the rain that he sends, making the hills beautiful. But, but read it, read it reflectively. Sometimes read it when you're out in nature. See all God has done. Look at Psalm 104. In Psalm 104, you see the same kind of picture. Uh, Psalm 104, uh, some have considered it built on the days of creation in Genesis 1. But listen, beginning with verse 10. 
He sends forth springs in the valleys. God sends forth springs in the valleys. They flow between the mountains. They give drink to every beast of the field and the wild donkeys quench their thirst. The, every beast, the wild donkeys, they drink of the water. In verse 12, besides them, the birds of the heavens dwell. They lift up their voices among the branches. He waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of his works. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the labor of men so that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine which makes man's heart glad so that he may make his face glisten with oil and the earth which sustains man's heart. The trees of the Lord drink their fill, the cedars of Lebanon which he has planted where the birds build their nests and the stork whose home is the fir tree. Let me sometimes encourage you to take your Bible outside. It may be at a beautiful site. It may be just in your backyard. But read passages like this and reflect on them. So one night in May, I was doing that a couple of years ago. It was one of those picture-perfect nights. It wasn't so hot that it was uncomfortable being outside. It felt just right. The sky was beautiful, beautiful blue, clouds, none of this that an artist could create. A breeze flowing just right, the birds singing in the air. It was a moment that you've experienced, but it's hard to even adequately describe. And it is a moment that no artist could adequately capture and paint. And yet some people would say that this picture of art has no painter. <laughs> that it just happened. All the various kinds of life, the birds that sing, the animals that crawl along the ground, the animals that get in your garden, all the various kinds of life that you see Ultimately, all of it is bursting forth to praise and honor and glory to God. I don't know how I can adequately explain to you how great our God is as revealed in nature. This lesson will fall short of its intended goal. But as we contemplate the God of creation, the God who created the heavens and the earth, the God who makes the streams and the mountains, the God who creates the birds and the trees that they dwell in, think of this third verse of the song. And I want to tell you why I love this song and why I was so quick to pick this song out when given this opportunity. Because this song spans really all of human history. It begins with God's creation of the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1, and it extends ultimately to the final day when Christ returns. But the first two verses focus on creation, and the third verse of this song focuses on redemption salvation and when I think that God his son not sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing 
He bled and died to take away my sin. Then seeks my soul, my Savior God to be. How great thou art. How great thou art. The God of creation is the God of redemption. The God who made all things is the God who sent his Son to die for our sins. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. And without him, not anything was made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The first few verses of John 1 tell us. God sent his Son. And Christ, who was God, along with the Father and the Spirit, Christ comes to our world to suffer in God. The one who spoke all those worlds into existence sent his son for you and gave himself for you. The last Wednesday night of this time, I was teaching Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, and taking upon himself the form of a servant, was found in fashion as a man, and humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death. In a lifetime, we're probably not going to properly appreciate all that passage tells us. Several years ago, a friend told me a story of going to Indonesia to preach. And when he went there for a short trip, he ran into some New Testament Christians that he didn't know existed, that he didn't know were over there. They were from America as well. And after the tsunami, they had gone to live in Indonesia to help the people there with all their They lived in a beautiful home provided by our government. A beautiful home with all the gifts and all the things that make life comfortable that we have here. And they lived in this beautiful home with all the modern conveniences of life. They were also guarded, protected, so that they were safe from any in Indonesia who might want to do them harm. But this family decided if we stay here secluded like this. We are never going to convert anybody. And so what they did is they gave up the beautiful home to live in a home among the Indonesian people. A home that had running water for one hour a day. And you guessed the hour. Because it wasn't always going to be the same. And you didn't always know. A home where they weren't constantly protected and constantly guarded. Where they could be subject to attack or violence. Now I want to tell you, brethren, when I hear of stories, 
by people, people like me. I'm ashamed of myself sometimes, and I'm in awe of them and their commitment. But what I want to do tonight, I'm telling that story, not just that you will stand in awe of people like that, but if that was the sacrifice, what was the sacrifice? What kind of sacrifice was it? For God to send his son from heaven to this world of sin and sickness and disease. To this world of pain and suffering. For this world of rebellion and defiance to God. For God to send his son knowing that he would be rejected and crucified, killed in such a horrible fashion. What kind of stealth was it for our Lord? To leave the glories of heaven, though he was rich, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 says, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. The one who spoke the heavens into existence. The one who spoke the heavens into existence through his son. That one sent his son, and that son came to be rejected, to be hated, to be murdered. When I think of how the God of creation made himself vulnerable, then sings my song. Fourth person this morning. When Christ shall come, with shout of acclamation. Now maybe you're like me, and you need to look up acclamation. Overwhelming shouting for applause. When Christ shall come. We shout of acclamation. What joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, My Savior God to thee, how great thou art. How great thou art. The Bible says, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be called up together with him in the clouds, and there we shall ever be in the Lord. This was written to encourage brethren who were afraid that their dead loved ones had missed out on the benefits of the Lord's return. It, it, but the emphasis is we will forever be with the Lord. In 2 Thessalonians 1, when Paul talks about Christ returning, he talks about him bringing vengeance upon the wicked and bringing, showing mercy to those who are his people. How Christ will come dealing out retribution, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, to those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel. And they will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed. That passage in 2 Thessalonians 1 talks about the dreadful fate of those who do not know God. And Christ will come in retribution. Uh, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God. 
And please, dear Christian, if you're a non-Christian, please consider those warnings. Uh, flee from that wrath. But the, the fourth verse of this psalm in 2 Thessalonians 1.10, they focus more on the blessedness of salvation when our Lord does come. When he comes to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who believe. I just checked those words, glorified and marveled at, and saw other places where they were used in the New Testament. And sometimes these are used in response to the miracles of Jesus. For example, in Luke chapter 5, the text tells us in round verse 17 that Jesus was teaching one day. And that suddenly uh, there, as the room was packed there in Capernaum, there is, there is an opening in the roof, and a man is let down in front of Jesus. And Jesus says, my son, your sins are forgiven. And some began to, to, to think evil thoughts in their heart. Who is this man who forgives sins? And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, which is easier? To say to this man, rise up and walk? Or to say your sins are forgiven. But that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I say to the paralyzed man, get up and walk. And this man who came in, apparently unable to move, gets up and walks. And the Bible tells us they glorify God. Luke 5, 25, and 26. In Luke 7, Jesus and his company were going into a town called Nain. A woman was leaving the town of Nain. Much different crowd. Because she was bearing her only son. She was a widow. She lost her husband. And now... She's lost her only son, and she's going out to bury him. And as she goes out to bury him, Jesus sees this group coming, and this woman weeping, he tells her, do not weep. He goes over to the tomb, or goes over to the casket, the coffin. He says, young man, I say to you, arise. Bible tells us this dead man arose and Jesus gave him back to his mother and they glorified God because of it. What's my point? When he comes, we will glorify him as if we had seen him making the paralyzed walk. We will glorify him as we would if we had seen him raising those who are dead, because that's what we'll be seeing, won't we? We will glorify him. We will marvel at him. Do you remember in Matthew 8, verses 23 through 27, the disciples were on a boat, and, and, and they wake Jesus up, and, and they said, Master, Master, we are perishing. This storm on the Sea of Galilee must have been severe. It must have been intense because some of these disciples were professional fishermen. They were used to the storms of the Sea of Galilee. This storm is so tenacious that they fear that they're going to die. And Jesus is asleep. They wake him up and Jesus gets up in the midst of this fierce storm and simply speaks and says, Hush! Be still!
our song. That talks about scenes of bliss. Forever new. Lies in succession. To our view. Throughout eternity. We will glorify him. We will marvel. We will be in his presence, world without end. And when that comes, we won't be worried about having to experience some difficulty in life, having ill health or less than plenty in this life. That will not seem anything because just one glimpse of him in glory will all the toils of life repay. When Christ shall come, we shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart when I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God. How great thou art. Let us pray. Oh, Never adequately understand how great you are. You told us that in your word. You're able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. Our minds are not adequate to grasp the thought. But may we in humility bow before. Lord, we are not worthy to be here. We are not worthy to be called by your name. I am not worthy to speak your word. Your grandeur and your glory exceed our greatest ability to understand or to experience. die for us, to bear our burdens, our sins, so that we might be saved. You have saved us at great cost to yourself. And you have prepared great things for us. We are unworthy. You are so great. Accept our feeble prayer. I shall come we shall of acclamation and take his people home. We want you to be there. We want you to be among that number. A number so great that Revelation 7 describes it as one that no man can count. We want you to be among that number of praising him and glorifying his name. If you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, if you believe that what we have said tonight about a God sent his son uh, to redeem us from sins, if you believe that and you're willing on the basis of that to turn from your sins in repentance and to be immersed, to be baptized in Christ for remission of sins, if you're ready to do that, the reverend here would be glad to assist you. If I have run through that too quickly, that you want to be right with God, please see some of us afterwards and 
we'll be glad to talk with you about it going forward. But when, that, when Christ shall come, we want you to be among that number, and we invite you to come. We can help you as we stand. Blessed assurance, Jesus mine, oh, what a poor taste of glory divine, heir of salvation, virtues of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my soul. before we depart. Uh, most of you know, <clears throat> most of you know Lynn Shea's brother Danny. Uh, Danny was hospitalized because of the COVID virus yesterday, I believe. And if you know Danny, you know he's pretty upset about it. And so the good news is that they tested him and he is negative, but they're not letting go until he tests negative again in a few days. So. Please pray that he remains negative and that the Lord will calm, calm him and give him some peace and, uh, and tranquility as best they can, as best he can there until he gets back home. So keep him in your prayers. Also, some good news. Sonny Collins had a little boy about an hour ago. And so we're thankful for that. Pray that uh, they will both be healthy and, and we have another soul to nurture along God's way as we go along. So uh, let's be praying to God about that. Uh, William asked that those uh, bag packers meet in the middle class classroom in a few minutes to get that taken care of. And of course, remember our Thursday morning class tomorrow, 10 a.m. And uh, Sunday, remember we're in two sessions, one worship at 9 o'clock, another worship at 10.30. So we expect to see you all then. And uh, be safe, consider others. Cover up when you can, and, uh, and let's go out and glorify God for what he's done for us uh, as we go through life. Brother?
As we conclude tonight, we'll sing the last two verses of How Great Thou Art. And when I think that God is Son of Spare Last verse of that song, when, when Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take us home. Father, sometimes we get so tired of being on this earth, but we are so, uh, it is so unknown what lies ahead of us. We pray that you would help us as we read our Bible that we can paint a picture of what heaven would be like and what that day when you come in the air to gather us home would be like. I can imagine a thousand pictures come through my head as to what it would look like, what it would be like, what the scene of heaven would be like. Of all those that are all, all gone ahead of us and all those that are coming behind us and all those of us that will meet you in the air if you come while we live on this earth. Thank you so much for Tommy's lesson. Thank you so much for that great song that you give us to sing all of the time. In Jesus' holy and blessed name we pray. Amen. Amen.